Hey guys, how's it going? Sorry, we're a couple minutes late here. Had a slow computer. Um, hey, Robert Ball and Greg. Hey, you guys. Um, like the title says, we are doing some three bet pot study today. Um, obviously, Jesse will be leading us. Um, it's going to be pretty information heavy, but we're going to try to get through it quickly and I'll keep the replay up on the channel for a little while if you guys need to go back. So he's made a little presentation for you guys today. So let's jump in. And as always, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat and I will save them towards uh, for the end of our little presentation. So let's find what we got. All right, and on the side, I'm gonna pull up some other things. So go ahead. I need to be able to move three bet. Okay, so we're going through three bet pots and the Basically what I did was I went through all the different board textures that you can have in three bet pots when you're in position and out of position. And what I like to do is I make little rules or heuristics for how to play different board textures. Um, anytime you can find something like, hey, on this board, the solver bets a small size 80% of the time, you could probably get away with 100% of the time then because that's not that different. And uh, it's not like your opponents are going to exploit that. Um, anytime you can find a little rule like that, that makes your life a lot easier, right? If you're trying to think of, oh, I got to check sometimes, I got to bet sometimes, or I got to go big sometimes and small sometimes, that makes it a lot harder. But when you can do one thing all the time, it's a really nice way to go about poker. Yeah. Um, so I looked for as many of these heuristics as I could find on different boards, and I looked for, and then I categorize each board type by how we play it. Um, and then I create a little presentation for it. So first of all, I wanted to go through the pre-flop ranges. Well, I need to get into flop some more. Okay. Um, um, this account needs to be up. Yeah, I have to log out and log in my other account. Oh. One moment. Just Jesse saying. If you just put it into that one, I think you can drag it right in You want me there. to just yeah. keep it in here? Yeah. Okay. So they can see it now, right? Yeah. Cool. Perfect. By the way, if you guys can't hear me well or if you can't see anything, just let me know in the chat so we can... Uh... By the way, do you want me to put this on 100 cash or 100 tournament? No, 100 cash. Oh, okay. So this is all for cash. Okay. Um, but if you play tournaments and you play before the antis, this will help you. Especially if you guys are coming to the World Series, they have. Yeah. I think they still have no antis in the beginning level, so who knows? Um, I'm gonna look it up. Yeah, no, WSOP has no antis in the beginning levels, I believe. Okay. World Poker Tours now have antis. But even if, even if no tournaments didn't have antis, it would be really good to know this in case you ever want to play cash. So, like, the reason I did this is because Ashley uh, has, you know, shown a lot of desire to play more cash games. And so it got me interested in studying more cash and playing more cash because I tend to like to to do a lot of the same stuff that she's working on. And um, it's fun to work together on this kind of stuff. And so um, I just started studying more cash and putting more stuff together for cash that would make it easier to think about these things. Okay, so Robert in the chat said that he doesn't like to four bet with anything other than aces or kings or three bet. Other than aces or kings. So maybe pre-flop is the best place to start. So I guess my question would be, why is that, Robert? Um, is it because you think that your opponents are really tight? I think he was joking, but oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't even think that's that bad of a strategy in some games, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Definitely in Vegas cash. Okay, so I go to 100 big blind cash. Um, I pull up cutoff raise. We're going to do, uh, for the out of position three bet pots, we're going to do cutoff for small blind. So I do a cutoff raise, small blind three bet. Um, and then I can go down here and I can look at, this isn't scrolling. Um, On a Mac, you have to go the opposite direction. Oh, ah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I can look at what the, what the small blind's three betting, which is right here. Uh, the darker the shade. Or like the more full looking the shade, the more you use it. So like you're through betting aces 100% of the time. That's pretty obvious. Um, and the lighter, the less you're doing it. 
And then I can also see what the cutoff's calling with. So before we get into like different boards, I just kind of wanted to look at these two ranges because um, if you think about how the ranges interact, it'll, it'll give you a good understanding inherently of how you play different boards. So like, what's the first thing that pops out to you when you look at the small blinds three bet range versus the cutoffs calling range? Uh, they don't have the top hands. Like they don't have the very best hands. Cutoff, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So that's really important, right? Um, now on ace high boards, it's not going to be as important to have ace high in your, aces in your hand because there's an ace on the boards. So you don't have it that often, yeah. right? But on like maybe jack high boards or 10 high boards, having all the aces and kings and stuff becomes super important because now you have all the over pairs that they don't have. Um, what's another thing that we kind of notice? That makes me toggle back and forth. Uh, they have a little more of like the suited stuff towards the bottom yeah suited stuff towards the bottom they have more of these lower pocket pairs yeah and they have a lot more of the suited broadways right so yeah. or i guess like these these kind of like jack 10 suited and stuff whereas you know they're they're mixing in some calls with these yeah. for the small blind so yeah so we have to be a little more careful um on like the lower boards yeah and especially if they're like connected so you can have like possible like flop straights or pair plus straight draws yeah um and maybe if there's like some three card middling boards we want to be kind of careful yeah right does yeah, that make they sense could have, they could probably have more straights and stuff like that on yeah boards. so and two pairs stuff not to like do a spoiler but you're gonna see some of that stuff be true and okay. you like you like naturally or we just naturally identified that just from looking at the ranges so it's it's just so important to look at pre-flop ranges and kind of like just yeah. get an understanding of like what we think is going to happen there yeah um Okay. Okay. So, out of position three bet pots. So, so this is small blind three bets against a cutoff open. Yeah, and right? the cutoff okay. calls. Hundred blinds deep. Yep. All right. So a side boards. We'll start with a side boards. Okay. A side boards are just generally pretty easy to play because on a side boards you bet really small, mm -hmm. and almost whenever you can bet really small on a board, almost always you can bet at a really high frequency. So I went through a bunch of different ace high, like disconnected boards, uh, disconnected two tone boards, um, disconnected boards with two high cards, disconnected boards with two low cards, whatever. And basically what ends up happening is there's just not that many checks on any of those boards. So if you wanted to, you could just bet like 15 to 25% every single time. And that's like a perfectly acceptable strategy that will be very, very difficult for your opponent to exploit at all. And even if they did, it would be like a tiny exploit. And uh, it's it's just really hard for them to play against, right? And like, why do you think that is though? Like, let's say that the board's ace, eight, deuce, rainbow. Like, why do you think that small bet is so effective? Um, because some people are just gonna feel like second pair is like dead to an ace, or it's not as dynamic. There's not gonna be a lot of overcards that come on the turn in river because you have an ace. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that's really it. Like they have so many of these. We saw before, right? uh cutoff has so many of these like uh, middle Frank said what program is this this is floptimal um it's like a pre-flop app where you can go through different positions and stack sizes but all we're using right now is the cash game ones so there's no ante in the middle and yeah. robert said i was actually addressing facing a three bet out of position pre-flop that's what he was saying so we're actually going to get to that in the second half of class right now we're doing the three better is out of position, out of so position. the caller's in position. Yeah, and then next we're going to do um, cutoff is the person who called the three bet versus, um, with the button. Yeah, so they're out of position facing a three bet. Right, yeah. okay, so we're going to get there, Robert. Um, <clears throat> so the reason why you like betting small and ace high boards is because they have all these hands, right? Yeah. All these um, non-aces hands that are just going to have to fold. Yeah. Because... You don't want to be drawing to like queen jack when there's an ace on the board because you could just be drawing dead. So a lot of these hands have to fold for not a very large price. As a bonus, what you said is also true. Like if if they do fold a hand like pocket nines mm -hmm. on ace eight deuce, like they should not be folding that hand. But if they do, then your strategy just becomes super winning. Yeah. So there's like a lot of upside to betting really small, and you're it's easy for your opponents to find too many folds, but it's hard for them to find too many calls on a board like that. So I really See? like a strategy like that. Um, yeah, this is this is Floptimal. This is the app that uh, me and my friends created. 
Um, it's just a, it's, well, it's a preflop solver and it's got a bunch of different navigation tools. So you can just quickly look at any preflop spot and, uh, it'll pull up what your theoretical range should look like. Yeah. Um, we use this a lot to study because then it's, it's really good for just quickly, um, especially if you're a tournament player, this is like a godsend for me. Cause I click through all the different stack sizes, um, very easily so you can just see a spot and be like okay what if i'm on 40 what if i'm on 50 um and then yeah i can look at this exact same spot in 40 big blind deep in in tournaments and not have to change anything but the stack size it's yeah so that's really nice but also i think i like using it for studying purposes because um we can very easily just like pull up all the ranges very quickly and compare them side by side and also compare them to what we think people are doing in real life yeah because not everybody is just gonna fold you know like pocket fours to your three bet or something like that but offers is small blind yeah. so there are even more hands that they might fold on the ace high flop when you bet i actually almost forgot um if people want to try this this is normally 30 bucks a month to use uh i made we made you a, a code you did um yeah okay nice. i'm gonna i'm gonna put the code in at the description on the bottom okay but it's uh I believe it's Ash Preflop, A S H P R E F L O P. And nice. people can try it for nine bucks a month for the first month. Cool. All right. Thank you. Hm. Yeah. All right. Um, so okay. So back to the slideshow. All right. So the only boards that we want to be kind of careful of not using the strategy on is monotone boards. And if it's like Ace Queen Four, three spades, you could still go super small, like 15%. Mm -hmm. And monotone boards always size down, so you, you want to go on like the smaller side of your sizing, right? But you can you can still bet every time. Mm -hmm. But if it's specifically like ace five deuce, you want to be really careful. So basically, on your ace high boards, we're gonna bet really small, one hundred percent of the time, except on the monotone boards that have like three wheel cards, stuff like that. We want to be careful on. So Mike Rojas says, for people who have way more weak aces in their calling range, he's talking about pre flop. How would you adjust your flop c bet strat? Uh. I guess I need to know what you mean by way more weak aces because if you like, look at we'll their... just compared to your like these ranges you're talking about. So he's saying if they have like all these, let's say they call every ace x suited, for example, to your three bet. Yeah. So if that's true, you could probably start throwing some checks in there with some of your very weakest stands, I think. Um, and then maybe you could um, size up a little bit when you have some of your stronger hands. But. If, if your opponents are calling you with every weak ace, they're either very fishy or you could be sizing larger preflop. A lot of people use use really like way too small sizes preflop. So when you're when you're three betting out of position, let's say your opponent makes it three times a big blind, you should be making like 14 times a big blind or something like that because you're you're trying to charge your opponent to get to play a pot in position against you. Yeah. Um. So there's a chance, you know, your opponent could just be a fish or a a splashy player and then they're just in there with too many ace x hands and they're going to kind of naturally punish themselves because they're going to be dominated on a side boards too much but and they're going to have to fold on other boards a lot but if that's true you should also check yourself and make sure that you're three betting big enough yeah um okay so that's our a side boards um and keep in mind that if you're if the board's more connected then you bet smaller. Sometimes that's not intuitive to people. They see like a connected board and they want to bet bigger because they want to protect their hand. But the more connected the board, the more it interacts with your opponent's range. So the smaller you want your size to be so you're getting a better price against the hands that do fold, if that makes sense. So so for instance, uh, on ace eight deuce, we could bet like 25% a pot, but on ace nine eight, we might bet like 20% a pot, something like that, because there's, there's less hands like Queen Jack is now not folding on this board, right? So yeah. we're we're just trying to get some hands like pocket fours to fold. So we're gonna bet really small. Oops. Hmm. All right, King High boards. King High boards are actually these were cool to look at because I didn't realize just how much of an advantage the three better has on King high boards. Really? Okay. It feels like if you look at the ranges, it feels like it's kind of like fair between the two players. Like you look at all these Kings. Yep. Um, but, but the fact that the cutoff almost never has ace King really hurts them. Yeah. And so you get to really dominate these King high boards. Now you don't bet that big that often on these boards, but you, you basically get to bet a hundred percent of pot 
or 100 percent of the time almost always on almost every board so frank said okay but they could just keep raising your 20 percent bets in position on those ace high boards yeah but if they raise your 20 percent, then you like a lot of the time you're gonna have an ace so you're gonna call their raise yeah like if they just try to like bluff you nonstop on those boards, it's not going to go particularly well for them because you have a lot of really strong hands. Right. So that's that's fine. We're just we're just interested in when you bet twenty percent a pot, you need to win one out of six times for your bluffs to be effective, right? So we're just trying to get a really cheap price on our bluff, and then if they want to start raising us a bunch, then we're like, cool, we have a bunch of ace x that we'll just start calling down with, and we're going to make a bunch of money versus your bluffs. Yeah. You'd be surprised too. I mean, it might be like a slight fear too of yours to be like, I want to bet. If I bet smaller, they're just going to see right through it. But you'd be surprised how often people don't attack very small bets. They'll just play, yeah, that's they'll also, just play their hand. That's also true. But even if they did over attack it, you can just find an ace a lot and win a really big pot. Yeah. Because your your three betting range contains a lot of aces. Right. Like that's right. the most frequent card that you have, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So on King high boards, we're betting a hundred percent of the time. Um, generally I start with like a medium size and then the more connected the board, uh, the smaller size that I use again. So Same if thing. it's like, okay. yeah. So if it's like King seven, six, two tone, then I'm going like 30%. If it's like King eight deuce rainbow, then I'm, I'm going more like, you know, 40% or something like that. Um, these are little nuanced things, but they're nice rules to have in general. Um, if the board is really connected, like king, 10, 9, or something like that, then you want to bet really small. And if it's three broadways, then you also want to bet really small. Why is that? Hmm? Why do you think that is? What? If it's three broadways, we want to bet really small. Or if it's like connected, like king, 10, 9, we want to bet really small. Um... Well, I but you don't want to like price out all of the like if you do have the nuts or something, you don't want to price out all of like the worst hands that want to continue. Um, that's sort of true. I think it's more just about our bluffs too, right? Like yeah. we're on King Ten Nine, a lot more of their hands connect somehow with that board than like King Eight Deuce. And so we're we're not really interested in trying to get that many of their hands to fold. So if not that many of their hands are folding, then we our, our bluffs want to go really small, right? Right. So something like pocket fours is, by the way, like the, like you're not going to have all the answers to what I'm asking you mm -hmm. because I've looked at these charts for way too many hours and you haven't. So it's like, it's, it's not really a fair game. Um, all right. On the monotone boards, uh, we're going to size really small again, and we can do that hundred percent as well, unless it's, um, really connected and then we have to kind of respect the fact that uh that board needs some checks but basically on almost all of the king high boards we can bet somewhere between 50 percent a pot and like 20 percent a pot 100 percent of the time so just keep mashing on king high boards <laughs> okay. until your opponents do something really weird to try to stop you and then maybe you have to adjust a little bit but you can basically just keep betting king high yeah. boards all the time because they're really good for you especially if you guys play live it's going to be a long time before people recognize Oh, every time he three bets from the small blind, he always bets king high boards. Like they're just never gonna pick up on that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, here's an example of one of the few boards uh, where you actually need to check a little bit. This is king jack ten monotone, and you can see like we're we're checking over half the time. Um, and so the green means check, and the red means your betting just so you guys yeah yeah so this is this is a good example of a spot where nearly every hand every combo is doing some amount of betting and checking um so what do we do here we've kind of talked about this in the past when the solver is like indifferent and all, with all of its hands hmm? like when, when the solver is kind of mixing everything how do we approach that um well we could use a randomizer or what's the other thing i always like to say I have no idea. We could we could do it based on our opponent, right? Yeah. If they're kind of like Don't tighter and they're much. folding too much, mm -hmm. then we could um we could see bet more. And if they're kind of loose and they don't seem to be folding that much, we could see bet less, right? Okay. All right, queen high boards. Um queen high boards we have to be a little bit more careful on 
we're going to be, uh, especially on like the disconnected ones, we want to be betting only half the time, whereas like on the king high boards, we're betting every time. Um, now we don't have that really strong advantage, right? Like we have about the same number of queens. They have all the ace queen. They're not really for betting ace queen. Um, so we have to be a lot more careful on the queen high boards because we don't have that that big of an event. Yeah, we have aces and kings and they don't, but that's about it now. Whereas like on the other board, we have this huge ace king advantage. So so we mix some bets and some checks on the queen high boards. And when we do bet, we bet about 40 to 50% of the pot, I would say. If you want it, I wrote 33 to 50%, but if you want to take like an average, you could do like 40% or something like that. Um, here is an example of like a disconnected queen high board and how we approach it. So what's like the first thing that stands out to you if you were to make a rule of how to kind of approach this board with different hands? Put me on the spot. I don't know. You just you just lead the question. Well, no, I mean, what like what? OK, what hands bet more or bet less? Uh, over pairs. Yeah, we bet a lot with over pairs. We want to check a lot when we have like these second pairs or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It looks um, like probably all the backdoor flush draws, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, King exactly. High, King high, ace high, backdoor flush draws want to bet, and then they probably just use their clubs to check the position. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> yeah, so um, so a lot of that is exactly what you should kind of be thinking about. Like maybe do a little bit more giving up with the ace highs without a backdoor flush draw, mm -hmm. because you're gonna have trouble continuing on different boards with those. Um, maybe do a lot of checking with like you'll notice like pocket eights do a little bit more checking and pocket don't, don't jacks ugh, so, yeah i forgot um pocket eights do a little bit more checking and pocket jacks do a little bit more uh betting that's probably because they're not folding pocket nines or tens so we get a little bit more value out of the jacks even though they like require less protection stuff like that um okay so on the really connected queen high boards like queen 10 9 queen jack 10 etc you can bet 100 percent um but you need to bet really small again you know you have to respect the fact that your opponent can have the nuts so you can't bet that big into the into the potential nuts you also um are just trying to pick a size that folds out hands like pocket fours or six seven suit or five six suited or whatever and you don't need to bet very big to, to get those hands to fold right um so that's something to keep in mind. And then again, monotone boards, we can bet 100%, but we need to keep it really small. And uh, if it's a really connected monotone board, again, we're going to mix our checks and our bets. So this is really cool if you guys notice that, like, the way that Jesse's kind of, like, framing all of this is um, obviously, like, based on board texture and that dictates like his bet size because it has all, everything to do with just all the ranges that he studies pre-flop then look at the board who's the board better for and that's how it's going to dictate the size and like how does your inner your range interact with that so if you see people that are just betting different sizes on different boards it doesn't necessarily mean oh they have a strong hand because they bet bigger or they have a weak hand because they bet 10 percent. it just might be that they have done all of this off the table work too and they they see a monotone board they know okay i'm supposed to bet small yeah that's something that both of us had to take a while to kind of get our brains around is that if we're truly betting a really small size on a board we shouldn't really be worried about our opponents being like oh it's a small size i'm gonna raise because we have all these other hands that are strong right, right so we're not like we're balanced and it's not a big deal like yeah. if somebody wants to do that yeah they they're gonna be right sometimes when you do have like the weak portion of your range and they're gonna think they're a genius but realistically like they're not they're just finding the weak portion of right. the range when you have the nut flush they'll also raise and then they'll just run into it so, yeah um just to be mindful of that okay jack high boards so once we start getting you're gonna see this as a trend as we start getting lower like the high card is a lower card um we're going bigger with our sizing and probably less often or yeah okay and do you know why we we do that or you have like a guess uh, as to why. We go bigger with our sizing. Yeah. Um, because uh you you need more protection from overcards coming exactly in, on future yeah. streets. Okay. So like if we have a nine high board, they've got a lot of hands with two overcards and they're in position, so they could float us a lot with those cards. Yeah. So we want to charge them a lot of money to not do that, to not realize equity with those sort of hands. Um 
So on the jack high boards, uh, the disconnected ones suited or off suit, we can bet 100% of the time and we actually go quite large. Oh. So the, the solvers. So it's not always correlated. Like you can still sometimes always bet big. Yeah, the jack high boards uh, are really special in that sense too. We I don't know what it is <laughs> about the jack high boards. I think it's because like a lot we we still have a lot of the suited jacks and stuff in our range mm -hmm. as the three better, and we have the over pairs. But like when we get to the lower boards, we have to be a little bit more careful. But on the jack high boards, we just get to go nuts. Okay, that's good to know. I don't cool. know if I would have thought of that intuitively. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't until I looked at this for sure. Yeah. There's like a lot of little things to learn for sure, but. If you watch this, and you guys might want to go back and watch this a couple of times because this is a lot of information, and I understand yeah. that. But if you go back and watch this a few times, this is this will provide you with so many shortcuts because I spent hours and hours looking at information to put this together, and like this was almost like me just creating notes for myself and then, and then we sharing just... them. And that's like that's kind of a lot of what like studying poker is, right? Is you're like you're looking at a bunch of information, raw information, and you're saying like, what rules can I make? I'm not going to remember all this stuff, like every individual thing, but I can make some set of rules and yeah, um, kind of go with those rules. So jack high boards, we can bet the solver likes 25 or uh, sorry, 50% or 75. So I said two thirds, 100% of the time. Okay. Really nice. On the super connected boards like jack 10, nine, um, we're going to pure check. And this is the first board where we've really seen that. But yeah, pure check is kind of the thing. Um, and then as it gets less connected, you check less of the time. So like Jack 10, eight, we get some bets in there. Jack 10, seven, we bet a lot and so on and so forth. So really you just want to be like very careful on Jack 10, nine, Jack 10, eight. Okay. And then everything else, if we were to bet hundred percent of the time, 66% of pot, even if the solver doesn't quite do that, I bet you're getting away with it and, and making a lot of profit doing okay. so. Assuming that you're, you know, you're, you're learn something, your three bet ranges aren't horribly out of whack. Yeah. This is a good, all of this stuff is a very good example of why you want to get your preflop ranges really, really yeah, tight. Yeah. Not, not tight as in like, don't play many hands, but get them like really perfected. Mm -hmm. Because if you have really strong preflop ranges, then everything else falls in place because you, you've created a nice balanced range that uh, you have coverage on all these boards. Um, here's a good example of one of the boards you mix, the Jack 10-8. Mm -hmm. And we see some things stick out immediately, right? We, we again, like we said before, we want to bet the over pairs a lot. Um, we want to bet stuff that has a lot of equity. So, for instance, yeah, ace queen is a good hand to bet because it's a strong queen, but like queen 10 is actually a really nice hand. It's always betting. Why? Because you have a lot of coverage on future streets, right? Mm -hmm. Like on, with ace queen, if the turn's like a seven, you feel pretty awful. But if you have queen 10 and the turn's a uh, seven, oh, I'm sorry, I I'm comparing ace, ace queen's a double gutter. I, I meant ace jack. Um, on ace jack, like if the turn's a seven, you feel pretty awful. But with queen 10 on a jack turn, you still have some outs, right? So you still have like a little bit more equity. So like playability doesn't matter when you're this deep. Um, yeah, and then pretty clear cut, you got to check all these bad ace x that don't really, that don't have two over cards and you got to check all these under pairs. Okay. Um, so this just, was the one of the boards that you said you don't see that 100% yeah, of the time. Yeah, okay. this, is, this is just the connected boards you really want to be careful on. Hey, um, AJ. Hey, James. Welcome, you guys. Jeff up, D guys? had a question that I want to pause really quick because I missed it. Um, he said, is, ad is advertising bluffs beneficial early on in the session? Yeah, I, I think it's super beneficial. I think Ivy was quoted one time saying, like, sometimes when he gets pot bluffing early in a session it's the most profitable thing that happens to them like it's true like if you especially if you run like kind of a a wild optimistic bluff uh you don't have to get caught either you could just show it <laughs> i think it's, that's what he's saying advertising yeah <laughs> it's better to show it probably yeah. but uh yeah i mean especially if you're playing if you're playing like let's say you can get invited to some cash game and it's like a wild game and everyone's kind of like looking for reasons to put money in the pot and you find some like the one guy that you think you can bluff and you run a big bluff on him and then you windmill it down on the table. Like, everyone else <laughs> at the table is going to call you for the rest of that session. And you want that in cash, right? You want people to call you down. Like The way we win at cash games is to, to make big hands and get paid. The way we win at tournaments is to find as much fold equity as possible and run hot. All right, next board. Ten high boards. So ten high boards are pretty simple um you if they're connected so like 10 8 7 stuff like that just pure check you're okay so on, starting so ace 
king, queen, jack, we're betting a lot. Yeah. For the most part. And then by the time we get to 10, now is when we start to, it doesn't even drop off. It's just like, no, pure check. Well, that's just connected. Okay. So like 10, 9, 8, 10, 8, 7, stuff like that. Okay. Some of those boards you do get some bets on, but I mean, it's not that much betting. So let's just pure check and make it easier. If you guys really want to get deep into the weeds and start finding like 30% bets, go for it. But pure check is a nice rule to have. Now, if it's disconnected, which is most of 10 9 boards, right? 10 6 deuce, rainbow, 10 5 deuce, 10 5 3, whatever. If it's fairly disconnected, we bet we we bet about half the time, right? And what size do you think we use? Um, oh, sorry, I think right here. <laughs> I didn't even see that, but I was going to say bigger just based on the jack. Yeah. But, yeah. So, uh, yeah. we're going we're going smaller high cards, so we're going bigger bet mm -hmm. size, right? So, so the solver almost exclusively uses 75. I just use 70 as like an average because there's a little bit of smaller, but it's okay. using 75 almost always. So yeah, so on all the other boards, we're going to try to bet like half the time and we're going to bet really big when we do bet. Um, so Mike board. has a good point that we should maybe address now that we're getting to the board, uh, sort of the high cards where we're checking more often. He said, I find I hardly ever check raise on in three bet pots. Are there boards where you do that more often and what hands do you use as a three better? So I just have that in the back of your mind if it comes up while we're dealing with like the lower top card boards because yeah. I feel like that's where it's going to come up more. So on every board where you, where you play some checks, you can have some check raises for sure. And I think in practice, check raising might even work better than in theory because your opponents, there's a lot of players who when they get checked to in a three bet pot, just bet a lot, right? Like, like on a queen high, like let's say it's queen seven deuce, they might just bet like pocket fives because like if my hand's good, I want to protect it. Yeah. And against those players, you want to find a lot of check raises. And, you know, those check raises might be with not flush draws, or they might be with something like a backdoor. We talked about this in the last one of these, like backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw type of hands. Um, and you might check raise over pairs. But, yeah, you you definitely want to find, or like bottom set might get check raised on some boards, but that's, you have to have a board where you have bottom set. Uh, but, yeah, you want, you want to be check raising. Can you maybe summarize... Maybe by the end of class, if you can't think of it right off the top of your head, but can you summarize what types of hands you would be using? Or Well, that was kind of what I was saying. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Zoned out a little bit. Uh, Bottom sets and things that don't block, block top. Pair. Well, like, I'd say more over pairs. Backdoor right, flush right. draw, backdoor straight shot. Or if there's, like, a flush draw on the board, then check raising some, like, nut flush draws might be good. Or check raising some... Some other type of flush trials might be good. It it depends on what you think of how your opponent's playing for sure. You could also just check trap everything if you wanted to, if they're like really aggressive and you think they just go for it. But yeah, Frank, good point. You said, yeah, but what are you repping when you check raise on Queen Seven Deuce out of position? It's hard to balance. This top pair would bet. Yeah, I mean, I would you can definitely check some top pairs. Um I would more be inclined to check raise over pairs. So for instance, I might check aces sometimes, especially if I think my opponent's kind of kind of overly aggressive and then yeah. find some check raises with a hand like that. Um, you definitely want to be check raising queens because you block so much of their continuing range when you have two queens in your hand. Um, so like pocket queens, but I wouldn't check raise pocket queens. I'd just check call it. <laughs> um, check, pocket seven yeah, so. might be a hand you want to yeah. check raise. That could be a cool hand yeah. to check raise, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, uh, on seven, on queen seven, deuce, rainbow, if you want to just check and then continue with just calls, I think that's a very reasonable way to go about it. And if you feel like you can't balance it well, then definitely just check call on a board like that. Honestly, like, it's such a dry board that you're not, you're not worried about letting a bunch of hands get there that often, right? Like, yeah, if they have pocket fives, they have two outs, but that's two outs. So it's, yeah. it's a lot less frequent. Um, all right, nine high and lower boards. Uh, we are going to pure check on the connected boards. Uh, you basically can't can't mess that strategy up, even on some of the boards where it does some betting. It's just not that much betting, so pure check. And um, on the other boards, like the disc, the more disconnected boards, uh, you mix seventy five percent and check seventy five percent of pot. This check. is everything nine high and lower. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we want to really blast big on these boards because almost every hand they ever peel has some sort like if you think of like an eight high board, there's no hand they peel preflop that doesn't make like at least a gutter or two over cards. Yeah. Like on even like okay, so on eight six deuce, they don't really have 
I guess they could have like four or five for a double gutter, but like ace four doesn't have a gutter, but on almost every other hand has two over cards or something like that. So you really want to bet big to make them fold those type of things. Now, if your opponents aren't that tough and, and you expect them to just snap fold king queen for 40% a pot, then by all means bet 40% a pot. But in theory, you should be betting quite large to make all these hands of theirs indifferent. Oh, I have a question for you. Okay. Can you guess which which type of low card boards are the best ones to bet? Why don't we have chat answer as well before I answer? Sure. I'll give you guys like 30 seconds. So based on this slide, so you're saying, can you guess which low cards are the best boards to bet as the three better? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. It's a very specific type of board and I haven't covered it at all yet. Uh, I'm going to give them a few more seconds before I guess. All right, I'm thinking maybe like a wheel board. Oh no! Oh oh wait 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 wait. Not wait. to bet. Trips trips boards. Yeah. Because I studied trips this. And paired boards. Trips boards. Yeah, because like you have aces. Like if it's five five five. Yeah. Or something. They yeah. Or just for you. Or just nothing's changed. They don't. Your opponent almost never has quads. So yeah yeah yeah. Whoever okay. had the better hand before the flop, like the better range before the flop, is still gonna have the better yeah. range, right? So that's. Those boards are really nice. Paired boards are similar. Like like nine deuce deuce is a really nice board to keep betting on. I would probably bet like 60% of pot. Yeah, Frank said like seven that. three deuce. Mike said wheel boards too. <laughs> wheel boards you got to be careful on. Really? Yeah, because they have way more sets than you. Or or like if there's no ace on the board, if it's like five three deuce, they have all the sets and you don't. Or they okay. can have a lot of the sets and you don't. Good point. Um, <laughs> there's some straights present. There's like a bunch of stuff. That you have to be pretty careful about. So wheel boards, you could bet wheel boards sometimes. I'm just saying you got to be like a little more careful on those. Um, but yeah, trips they never have anything on trips, right? Mm -hmm. Like three, three, three. What do they have? He's three suited. Okay, like yeah, one out of like mm -hmm. yeah, it's just so they might rare. Not even call sometimes. Um, Frank said he's not worried. Can you click this real quick? Yeah, not worried about hands. Getting there, worried about the guy in position knowing that we wouldn't check for his top pair or better. This is talking about like the queen high boards. When so you you're worried about them. getting bluffed on future streets, I guess? Yeah, or just getting um, floated. Or he's talking about when he check raises. Yeah, he's talking about when he's check raising and somebody calls. You with, can check pair. some top pairs and check call. Like on queen seven deuce, you should check some like queen 10, queen jack, and check call sometimes. So if you want to just play a check call strategy, that's fine. Right. Yeah, but on five five juicy guy in position has all the fives. I mean, what are all the fives? Let's pull up let's pull up this again because honestly, this this is cutoffs what they're supposed to call ace five and a little six, bit of five, six, five and five five, five five. That's like barely any hands. Five five's not to, even in there really. Yeah. And maybe five four compared to all these other hands that they have in position. Also so. five five would be quads, so there's only one yeah. combo of it. Six five and five four, maybe people call more than they should, but even then, there's two there's two combos of five four suited on five five dudes. There's two of six five and there's two of ace five. And then you just have like they've got like a hundred and fifty other combos of hands or something like that. So Yeah. I wouldn't don't, worry too much yeah, about them don't having overly, trips. Don't or I think that's a common thing too. Like don't overly worry about the nuts. I sometimes go straight to like who has the nuts in this spot. And if I can't have the nuts, I like, you know, I yeah. overly weight weight my decision based on like who can have the nuts, but in this spot, it's yeah, they have more fives than you do, but it's just a tiny portion of their overall range that's continuing in position against your three. We bet. get our range, three small blind. Yeah, I mean we have some six five and some ace five, so we have almost the same amount. Of yeah, fives. we have almost the same amount of fives that they do. So don't be too worried. Hey Rob, thank oh, what's you very up? much. <laughs> Rob from Nashville. Yeah, so how you doing, man? <laughs> These vids are unbelievably informative. Thanks so much for doing it. No problem. Yeah, sorry we made this one an hour earlier. I know it's harder for people to get here at this time, but Jesse had to play some poker tonight. So we're going to keep it up on the channel, though, so you guys can uh, watch the recap later on. All right. Well, on 5-5 five, five Deuce, we rep all the over pairs. So we've got a lot of strong hands. Um, okay, let's, let's keep going because we got a little bit more time. Uh, okay, so here's a good example of a low-card disconnected board that we're betting like half the time. 
Um, what are some cool takeaways from this? So this is something me and you have talked about a lot where the the over pairs that need the most protection are like that are just over the top card of these low boards, like pocket 10 in this instance. This uh, pattern always happens with PO where you see that they want to bet the most often. And as you go up higher in pairs, those hands need less protection as you go along. Yeah, with, yeah. With turn and river, so you don't need to bet as often. Um, so that's the first thing that stands out to me. Um, it also looks like they're using their worst Broadway holdings, like two overcard holdings as um, C bet. Yeah. Like the ace 10, king 10, queen 10, jack 10, all the way down. Well, also those. Those, Those all have backdoor straight. straight draws. Yeah. 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 So they, they're probably using a lot of the backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draws to bet. And not a lot of the other stuff. And then interestingly, you are checking pocket nights a hundred percent of the time. Um so that's that's a good thing to note. In fact, you're if you have a set, you're basically just checking it. Um but yeah, exactly what you said is like the biggest thing that stands out to me is that you want to protect your your over pairs that are the that are the most vulnerable and you can do more trapping with the over pairs that are less vulnerable. So like basically pure check aces and start betting Kings and Queens and stuff like that, or, or maybe like check aces, bet half your Kings, bet your Queens. But that's, that's kind of like a breakdown of how to, how to go at those boards. Spring, do you ever bet 10% to induce a raise so you can re-raise out of position on this board? Um, I mean, I don't think that that should be like your set strategy, but if, if you have an opponent that you've noticed just like loves raising small bets, sure. Yeah. I, I'm I'm down for any adjustment that you make in <laughs> poker as long as you have a good reason for it versus the player that you're up against. Yeah. So if you're just like, oh, I'm going to do this because maybe he'll raise, like, and you have no real strong reason why this player will raise, I might not do it. But if you're like, this guy just loves, whenever I give him rope, he does something absurd, then yeah, go for it, man. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm all for these like specific player adjustments. Like, what was that Doyle line that he said one time at the at a final table? He said, "We're not playing solitaire here." Like, <laughs> like definitely do stuff like that if you think if you feel strongly that it's going to go well, or you yeah. you have a good reason for it. Just make sure you always have a good reason for stuff like that. Yeah, I would also make sure that you've seen showdown, and it's not just like there's some things that we project onto other players about how we think they're playing, but we've never actually seen showdown. So you can never really know unless you've seen showdown at some point. Um, Especially live, it's just a small, such a small sample. Mm -hmm. That was one thing that K Rab always says: like, wait until you see showdown to like adjust wildly yeah. from your set strategy. Yeah. Okay, in position. So now we're looking at cutoff opens, button three bets, cutoff calls. So how does that change things? All right, this is for right, you. So we're Robert gonna Paul. go. We're gonna go back to Floptimal. <laughs> we're gonna have button raise, and we're gonna look at. So this is the buttons three bet ring. So this is cutoff opened button three bet and now so now we're just looking at buttons three bet so this is what pretty different right it we're mixing in a lot more of these first of all we're so when we did it with the with the small blind when i put in the small blind three bet it's pretty linear right it's like it's Good all hands. like the the best hands yeah and yeah. and as you go down to the worst hands it's generally getting like less and less of those combos but when we get to the button the button has a lot of incentives to just peel and see a flop with a lot of its good hands like king queen suit it's peeling a lot right queen jack suit it's peeling a lot ace jack ace 10 are peeling a lot um hands like pocket jacks aren't pure three betting they're peeling a lot why because we get to play in position now playing in position is great yeah um when we were a small blind we wanted to three bet hands like jacks because we want to charge our opponent to get to play in position against our jacks um so this is going to change things a little bit because we have a, a different range we still have a lot of the strongest hands, obviously, and we still have a, like, a good amount of the medium strong hands in here. We just don't have all of them. But in exchange for not having all the medium strongest hands, what do we have? We have position. So that's pretty massive. Um, so we're going to kind of see what that does. We also have to keep in mind that anytime we have a flop decision uh, now uh, as a three better, we... When we check, we just get to see the next card. So that may change how we want to attack different boards, right? Because yep. now there's more value in clicking the check button. Mm -hmm. Our opponent doesn't just get to bet after we check. We just, we're just like, I get to check and see the next street. Um, and then can we see what cutoff is supposed to call? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I was forgetting something. So they have a lot more of the 
the low stuff. Yeah, so I think what's happening here, if you look at their hands, they have 10% of all hands. If we three bet from the small blind, they end up with 9% of all hands. So it's kind of similar, but... Just weighted differently. Because we're a little more distributed to weaker hands, I think the cutoff gets to continue with more hands. So that's, mm. that's going to be beneficial going the flop, right? Because they have a weaker range, so they have a range that we can attack a little bit more. The more hands, and this kind of goes back to someone saying, what if they peel all the aces? The more hands our opponents peel, because more hands means weaker hands because they've already put in all like the strongest hands, the more we get to attack on different board textures, right? Um, okay. So again, ASI boards. ASI, we are going with 100% bet frequency, um, somewhere between like 25 and 33%. So now that we're in position, we're betting a little bit larger. Remember, what, do you remember what we were betting out of position on these boards? Um, like 20%, 15? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was 15 to 25, so 20%. Okay. Um, now that we're in position, we're betting a little bit bigger. Why is that? Because um, if we wanted to, we could check back, right? So we're, we're essentially saying like, uh, how do I put this? We so, have the ability to check back and we're not choosing to do it. So we want to bet a little bit larger. Um, uh, the other thing is, is like when, whenever you bet in position um, and you go a little bit larger, you're making a bigger pot, which, which means you get to play in position in a bigger pot on later streets. So that's really beneficial, right? To yeah. like juice up the pot to get to play more, more streets with a bigger pot in position. Anytime, like you want to play big pots in position. You want to play your small pots out of position, essentially. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so disconnected rainbow boards and all the paired boards, we're betting hundred percent of the time for a uh, smaller size, small, smaller size, I guess. And then on the other ASI boards, we mix a small bet and a check. Okay. So you're meaning all other ones just have like a flush draw or have some sort of other Broadway card in there. Yes. Okay. So here is my example. Um, ace, eight, seven, two tone. This is a board where we're, you could tell we're betting, we're checking like 55 60 percent of the time or something like that and um the question is what are we betting so we're very clearly betting sorry we're, we're very <laughs> clearly betting our i get it we're very clearly betting our two pairs a lot um we're betting our strongest top pairs we are not betting hands like kings, queens. Um, when we get down to like jacks and tens, you bet a little bit more, but you still don't really bet it. You bet your sets a lot. You don't bet your top set all the time. You check, you trap with that a little bit. Um, but kind of what you're what you're thinking, right? You do a lot of checking with your weakest ace x and pot controlling with those. You do a lot of pot controlling with your second pairs like kings and queens and stuff. And you bet a lot of your strongest top pairs, your two pairs, maybe some flush draws, maybe some backdoor flush yep. draws, things like that. All right, king high boards. Remember what happened to king high boards out of position? We bet a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so again, we bet a lot. Okay. This time we go 25 to 30% size. I think before it was a little smaller. Okay. Um, but yeah, 25 to 30% size 100% um, of the time on nearly every king high board. And the only exceptions to that rule are uh, you size up a little bit on the paired boards with lower pairs. So like king 6-6. Six, six, Rainbow or two-tone, you'd go a little bit larger. Uh, King 10, 10, you'd still stay pretty small. Okay. Um, you size down on the monotone boards. So like we're going 20, 15 to 20% on the monotone boards. And you mix bet and check if there's three Broadway cards. So if it's like King, Queen, 10, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Queen eye boards. All right, we're just going to fly through these last few because it's just, um, if you guys have kind of like studied on your own a little bit, you'll know like you're going to want to dig a little bit into this to figure out why you're doing these things. I want to, I don't want to encourage you to just like memorize everything, but yeah. Yeah. Queen high board. Yeah. I mean, don't, it's not so much memorization as understanding why you do things. Yeah. And then you'll, if you understand the why behind stuff, you're going to, you're, you're only going to play better than if you memorize anything. Um, yeah. So, just... if you, so if you guys have any questions about like the sizings or the percentage of the time that you bet these boards, like please ask, and then it'll it'll stick a little better if uh, if Jesse explains to you why. 
if you yeah. have a question about it. But I think you did a good job putting out of position, so we kind of already know. Yeah, queen eye boards. Um, on disconnected boards, we can bet half pot every time. It's like queen seven deuce, queen six deuce, whatever. Um, when there's two connected cards, we have to mix it up. So we bet half pot half the time, and we check half the time. So I feel like we're betting these queen high boards a lot more than in the other position, right? Uh, well, disconnected is somewhat rare, right? Because like queen, it's easier to see like a queen four three or queen seven six board than like queen seven deuce or queen six deuce. Like the the super yeah. disconnected boards are kind of there's only a few there's of them, not right? That many. That makes sense. Okay. Um, like even like queen queen nine or queen ten deuce is like somewhat connected. Um, so I I. I feel like maybe because I made these both separate things, it looks like they happen half the time, but like really this happens a lot more than this. Okay. Um, super connected boards are interesting. We just get to bet 100% of the time for half pot. Queen Jack 10 is the most obvious reason why, right? Because uh, we have Ace King. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't. And that, there's a lot of combos of Ace King. Mm -hmm. We also have like all the sets, a lot of the two pairs, whatever, that they don't have, but. You get my point. Um, paired boards, we bet half pot 100% of the time, and that'll work pretty well for us. And monotone boards, we can bet 25% 100% of the time. So, yeah. Slightly bigger. Every, everything's slightly bigger. In yeah. Position. And in Texas. <laughs> um, okay, jack high boards. Disconnected, half pot 100% of the time. Two connected cards, half pot. 100% of the time. And if there's a flush dress, <laughs> side down. Um, basically, jack high boards, like the last time, we're just betting a lot. And yeah. there's a few caveats to the rules, right? Um, one is if it's really connected, we bet really small and we don't bet all the time. And if it's uh, monotone, we bet really small 100% of the time. Otherwise, you can just bet 50% of pot 100% of the time. And you're going you're gonna to have a very strong strategy on those boards. So really attack the jack high boards. Mm -hmm. In fact, well, from what we've seen so far, attack the ace high boards for small size, king high boards for small size, queen high boards, you mix it up, and jack high boards, you attack all the time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes it easy to remember. All right. And finally, we have the 10 high and lower boards. Um, on these boards, you use a big bet at a high frequency on the disconnected boards, like we saw when we were out of position. And you mix it up when there's a flush draw or connectivity. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right. One. Is that it? Oh, here's, a, here's an example of a 10 higher lower board. Um, yeah, we've kind of looked at similar stuff, but you're really happy betting your over pairs. Because there's a flush draw present, they have more things to continue with, so you're happier betting your sets um, and your two pairs. And then you mix in some. Some ace high flush draws, some ace high backdoor flush draws. You mix in some over cards with backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draws. You bet your nines. Um, but it's all kinds of, it, all this stuff you see, like it repeats over and over again. Yeah. And if you keep applying these similar ideas when you're mixing on boards and you keep C betting 100% on the boards and hammering those boards, you know you get to C bet 100% on, you're just going to do really well. And not only are you going to do really well, but because you're betting 100% on some of these boards, you're going to look really aggressive. So you're gonna have other spots where like you just have it and you get paid off or whatever because you're in there a lot. People have to like justify making big river calls or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So these things are important. Yeah. Plus, just studying like flop play in general. Once you know it from this point of view, when you if you see somebody betting certain flop textures way too often, now you can like check raise them a little more because yes. they're just if they're just betting 100% of all board textures. And it's like yes. a low card board that they're supposed to check a lot and you just see them constantly betting it. Now you can just like exploit that in that in, uh, opponent. But For sure. Anyway. For sure. Let's do a couple more questions. We'll call it. Um, James said that's the best advice on any board. <laughs> Don't memorize it. Know the reason for the action. Yeah, that's pretty much the gist of all of poker study. Um, that's sort of been like the like the chasm, I guess, that people are trying to like phil is like they've studied solvers and now they're trying to play against real humans and understand why the solver is doing what it's doing um but if you don't know how why the solver is doing what it's doing then 
getting them playing against someone that's not playing like the computer you studied against is going to be really frustrating for you. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be really frustrating to play against someone who's not playing. That's why a lot of you get that phrase oh, like, oh, I have to move up where they respect my raises. It's like these people are playing too many hands. It's like, great. They're playing too many hands. You're automatically winning more money by sitting at that table. Um, Keep in mind that all this theory is to give you a strong strategy, but it's also to understand where the where the starting point is so that if you think somebody's doing something too much, you know that they're doing it from that starting point. It, you can't like say someone's raising too much if you don't know how much they're supposed to raise, right? Yeah. Or you can't say like, oh, they fold too much if you don't know how often they're supposed to fold. So like the point of theory is to uh, like get an understanding of where people are deviating it from it and then you can make adjustments from that. And it's also to give yourself a really strong baseline strategy to, to build from. Robert said, Jesse, this is a great synthesis of a lot of information. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, we're gonna end with this one. Frank went says, "When is Jesse gonna play on Hustler?" <laughs> I mean, they gotta give me an invite. <laughs> I don't know. I don't uh, know if they. Uh... We don't know. That's the answer. <laughs> All right, you guys. I'm gonna keep this recap up on the channel for a while. Please enjoy, and we'll see you guys in two weeks. We'll do one last coaching session before the summer. We're gonna talk all things WSOP like AMA style. So if you have any questions, if you're coming out for the summer and you just want to hang out for a minute and get um, some tips or some questions answered from locals, show up two weeks from now. Um, I'll let you guys know the date and stuff on Instagram. See you guys then. Thanks for joining everyone. Thanks for modding, Greg. And I will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye. Take care. Oh, uh, if people want to try Fluptimal, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna, drop, we're gonna drop the uh, we're gonna drop the code. Well, we're gonna put it. We'll just put it in the description. Yeah, I'll but, put it uh, in the description below. I'm gonna say it right now. I think I said it right before, but I just it's want to make like sure. Ash Preflop. Uh, if you guys liked the Preflop program, that's Jesse's program. It's called Floptimal, and you can get a discount of nine dollars for a whole month of checking. No, out. it's nine dollars to use for the month. Yeah, instead, instead of thirty. Right. Yeah. What's the code? Ash preflop. Ash preflop. All right. We'll put it in the thing. That's how we should have.